Karl Marx writing in poverty in his home in London, not too far from where we're speaking from today, said the following, never before has someone written so much about money who has so little about it, little of it, sorry. But he also noted that not even love has made so many fools of men as the pondering over the nature of money. We see that throughout history, money has always held a revered place within society. It seems ubiquitous and omnipotent. It appears like a mystical force that's imposed upon us. Under capitalism, all of our needs are relegated to the need for money. And we see today how the bourgeois economists are dazzled by the question of money. You have a whole school of bourgeois economics called the monetarists, people like Milton Friedman. And on the other side of bourgeois economics is the neo-Keynesians, people who preach about modern monetary theory. And both of these camps of bourgeois economics, they imbue money with a mystical power. These charlatans believe that the entire capitalist system can be controlled through monetary policy and the money, and the money supply. This is what Marx called so-called tricks of circulation. Today, the question of money is being discussed in every household, every business, and in every newspaper, because inflation in the advanced capitalist countries has reached levels not seen in decades. In, in Britain, inflation is now officially at 9.4%. In the USA, it's 9.1%, and in the Eurozone, it's 8.6%. In countries like Turkey, Argentina, Lebanon, and Sri Lanka, people have effectively given up trying to measure inflation. You have the threat of hyperinflation in these countries that are particularly at the acute end of the crisis of capitalism. Inflation, by definition, means that a currency loses its purchasing power as the price of goods and services rises across the board. In this respect, it can seem like money, uh, the inflation is a monetary phenomena, as Milton Friedman, the monetarist economist, described. And it seems like inflation, therefore, should be tackled simply through monetary policy and monetary methods and means. But Marx described this as money fetishism, this stupefied fixation on money and this one-sided focus on the money supply to solve our economic problems. In fact, Marx said, the riddle of the money fetish is really the riddle of the commodity fetish. In other words, if we really want to understand monetary phenomena, we need to go back and look at commodity production and exchange. To understand questions like inflation, we need to ask, what is money and why does it arise historically? And this means going back and understanding the laws of value, the dynamics of capitalism, which is a system where all of production is commodity production, production for exchange on the market, and where all social relations, relationships between people are reduced to money, money relations. If we understand these real laws that underpin capitalism, Marx said, then all further analysis would simply be reduced to looking at the forms of money, whether it be coins or cash, credit or cryptocurrencies. Inflation, then, is not simply a mon monetary phenomenon, as Milton Friedman asserted, and nor can the economy simply be controlled through monetary policy and monetary means, these tricks of circulation, as both the monetarists and the MMT, the modern monetary theorists, believe. Capitalism is a system of generalized commodity production and exchange, where the means of production are privately owned, and the economy and investment is not driven by the availability of money, but by the drive for profit. Resources aren't allocated rationally, but by the invisible hand of the market in an anarchic way. The inflation, the crisis, the chaos that we see all around us today in the global economy are the result of these laws and logic of capitalism. And if we want to understand the causes of the current inflation crisis, we must look beyond monetary questions and examine the contradictions of capitalism and its, and its system and its laws as a whole, starting with the fundamental dynamics of capitalism, of commodity production exchange and the law of value. Only then can we really answer the question, what is money?
And I'll discuss this briefly for those who might not have been at Rob Sewell's session on the labor theory of value yesterday. Marx said that commodities are goods and services that are produced by labor for not for individual use and consumption, but for exchange. And he pointed out that these commodities have a dual nature. They have a use value. They have a utility within society, a usefulness. But they also have an exchange value, a quantitative relationship to other commodities. And Marx explained that this value is related to the labor time needed to produce commodities. Things that require more socially necessary labor time to produce them are more valuable. This includes both the living labor of the immediate producers, but also the dead labor embodied within the tools, the materials, the infrastructure that are required for production. Prices are the monetary form or expression of exchange value. And these prices fluctuate according to market forces of supply and demand. If uh, demand exceeds supply, then prices will go up. But generally, the fluctuation of prices are around some sort of average, which is the value of a commodity given by its socially necessary labor time. But this all assumes perfect competition, which doesn't exist in reality. In fact, you see distortions in the market, barriers to supply, Things like monopolies, which can restrict the supply of goods and push prices far above their actual value. And all of this is really key to understanding inflation and to understanding what is money. Fundamentally, money, Marx says, is a universal measure of value. And the money system we see, made up of currencies and credit, express the distribution of value within society. The money we have or don't have in our pockets, whether it's cash or numbers on a screen in our bank account, this is an entitlement to a portion of society's total wealth of commodities. And in theory, this whole system is backed up by the state, which attempts to provide confidence and trust by giving money, by giving currencies the, the state seal of approval, the leg legitimacy. Now, studying history, we see that money didn't always exist. It's associated, the emergence of money is associated with the development of class society and commodity production and exchange. Early societies weren't split into classes of exploiters and exploited. They were based on what Marx and Engels called primitive communism. This is common ownership over the products and the tools within tribes. You had no exchange between individuals within society, so there was no need for money as a means of exchange. Instead, you had production for the common good and consumption on the basis of need. But all of this on the basis of a very low level of the productive forces, of scarcity, not of superabundance. Similarly, we don't see money as we would think of it today in the earliest civilizations in Mesopotamia. Instead, what you see is a system of top-down bureaucratic management and accounting, much like you have in a modern corporation where you have accounting going on and a unit of account, but you don't have money exchanging hands within the firm. Money then arises with the development of production, uh, commodity production exchange and with trade. Production is no longer for individual or communal needs, but for exchange with others. And this doesn't begin within societies, but at the fringe of societies, between different tribes. One tribe trading its surplus with the surplus of another tribe. But once this process begins, it, this, this logic spreads and develops through society. In the words of Engels, it, money becomes like a corrosive acid that penetrates through society and dissolves all the old communal bonds. And organically, over time, a single commodity emerges that acts as a universal equivalent. One commodity against which all others can be compared and for which all other commodities can be exchanged. This universal equivalent is the money commodity. And this money commodity acts as a means of circulation, a means of exchange. It acts as a unit of account, allowing different individuals and, and parts of the economy to be compared. It allows uh, to, uh, individuals to store their wealth. It becomes a, a store of value. 
and it becomes a means of payment, uh, a means of settling debts and uh, paying your taxes. But this money, it, as I said, it doesn't arise in a conscious or planned way, but due to the needs of society and of trade and the market that is developing. The initial commodity that becomes the universal equivalent is fairly accidental, but it still has a material basis related to what are the most important commodities within a given society. For example, in some nomadic tribal societies, you have herds of cattle acting as money. But it was the needs of trading societies, particularly early ones uh, in Greece and uh, Turkey, that led to the development of precious metals as the money commodity. We see gold and silver becoming the money commodities. Because these metals were relatively homogenous, they all looked the same. They could be divided up into little coins. They were durable, so they could be carried over long distances. But importantly, these metals were very valuable themselves. They contained a lot of socially necessary labor time in their production. Marx points out that gold became money not because it was revered, but gold became revered because it was money. Now, over the centuries, the expansive needs of the economy led to a debasement of these coins. In other words, their nominal values became separated from their actual values. It might be called a pound of silver or gold, but there wasn't actually a pound of silver or gold in the coins. So instead of money uh, being a, a, a commodity itself, money became a representation or symbol of value. And once this step was taken, it paved the way for paper notes and for even digital representations. These papers and numbers that are mere tokens of value. This was all happening because of the needs of the economy to expand, the need for more and more money to lubricate exchange. But it also adds enormous contradictions and potential instability into the system. You now have the potential for these money tokens in circulation to become divorced from the real value in circulation in the form of commodities, unless they are anchored to some sort of material base like gold. And this in, brings in inherent inflationary pressures and tendencies into the economy. For example, if you double the amount of money in circulation in the form of these tokens, but if the value in circulation in the form of commodities in the economy stays the same, then all else being equal, prices will double across the board. And this is what monetarists mean when they say that inflation is simply a monetary phenomena. And they're correct, actually, in this respect, to warn of the dangers of recklessly printing money and of Keynesian policies, which have this expansionist inflationary tendency. And the monetarists say that the solution is to go to tight money policy, have a tight money supply. And this is why they're in favor of monetary systems like the gold standard, which anchors the money supply to something material, to a base with its own real value namely gold. The gold standard was introduced initially in Britain in the decades following the Napoleonic Wars, precisely to try and control the debts and inflation that had come about as a result of these wars. And it spread through the dominance of British imperialism and the impetus of international trade. All co national currencies became tied to gold. But this whole setup of the gold standard came unstuck in World War I when different countries started to print money in order to fund the war. The gold standard couldn't handle all the contradictions and tensions that had built up within the world economy, with different national economies moving at different speeds in different directions. Very similar, actually, to what we see with the Eurozone today. All these different currencies pegged to each other. In the case of the Eurozone, all, all the different economies just pegged within the, this one single currency. In the case of the gold standard, all of them pegged to gold. And this meant, and it means today, that if different economies uh, start becoming uh, less competitive, for example, the only way they can increase their competitiveness is through internal devaluation, a tax on wages. And this paves the way for explosive social movements, like what, the, what was seen in Britain in the 1920s, which led to the 1926 general strike. The British ruling class tried to bring Britain back onto the gold standard at a rate that was not sustainable. 
So they had to attack the working class and that paved the way for a general strike. Now, eventually the gold standard collapsed with the onset of the Great Depression. And this was similar to the reasons it collapsed at the beginning of the First World War. Different governments wanted to try and devalue their currencies in order to export more, to print more money, to fund their banks. In other words, they wanted to export the crisis of capitalism to another place, to another country. Now, after World War II, the gold standard was then replaced by what was known as the Bretton Woods system. The dollar became the world currency with all other currencies tied uh, to the dollar, which in turn was tied to the gold standard. The dollar was deemed as good as gold because two thirds of the world's gold was in Fort Knox. And this reflected the strength of American capitalism, which emerged from World War II as the hegemonic imperialist power. And this provided some stability for a, for a while. On the basis of the post-war boom, this massive expansion of the productive forces and an expansion of world trade. But again, it began to break down at the end of the 1960s because of inflationary policies in the advanced capitalist countries. Keynesian policies of deficit financing and high military spending. And eventually Bretton Woods collapsed in the 1970s, just before the, the oil crisis and the world recession. All of these reflecting the contradictions that had built up in the world economy. And after Bretton Woods, you had a move to what was known as floating currencies or fiat currencies, which is what we have today. Money supplies that are not anchored to any material base like gold. And these floating currencies allow governments and central banks to print money without any restrictions. And many governments and central banks will take advantage of this at a time of crisis or even in periods of growth. But the result is to introduce all manner of contradictions and distortions within the capitalist system, a market system. And it doesn't remove any of the contradictions of the nation state either, or any of the contradictions of capitalism as a whole. Instead, it allows nation states to try and print their way out of a crisis and to devalue their currencies, which only prepares the way for bigger crises and sharper tensions down the line. And so the monetarists, in a respect, are, are correct to highlight the, the flaws, the limits of Keynesianism. But the thing is, they confuse cause and effect. They're idealists, empiricists. They imagine that attacking the symptom is the same as curing the disease. They highlight the inflationary dangers of Keynesianism. And they point to examples like Weimar Germany 100 years ago or Venezuela today, correctly pointing, that you, pointing out that you cannot print your way out of a crisis. And from all of this, they conclude that you need tight monetary policy, tight money supplies. But what they don't understand and explain is that the gold standard and Bretton Woods collapsed for a reason. Up to a certain point, these monetary systems were able to develop the productive forces and facilitate an expansion of world trade. But as the capitalist system expands, contradictions accumulate. You have credit, which is money created and lent out by the banks. And this credit expands, the, the supply of credit expands in order to artificially expand the market, in order to temporarily try and overcome the contradiction and crisis of overproduction. In other words, the needs of capitalism outgrow the restrictions of the monetary system, which in the case of the gold standard and Bretton Woods meant anchoring the money supply to something material these different national economies begin to move in different directions. Monetary systems therefore reach their limit and turn into their opposite, becoming a source of instability and crisis. But this is the important point. These monetary crises at root are a reflection of the contradictions and crisis of capitalism. They are a rebellion of the productive forces against the fundamental barriers to their development, the nation state, and private ownership. Walls to go back to the gold standard are therefore completely utopian. Over the last century, we see all these bouts of inflation in wars and crises. In the 1940s, in the 1970s, and now today. But these are only a symptom of the real problem. In recent decades, inflation has been relatively subdued in the advanced capitalist countries.
But on the other side of the coin, no pun intended, you see a huge accumulation of debts. And both of these, the inflation and the debts, are an expression of the same thing. They reflect the fact that capitalism is a senile, sick system, which can only be kept alive by these constant injections of debt and money. We see, therefore, that monetarism is at root reductionism, trying to reduce this complex uh, system down to just one factor, one element. They say that inflation is simply a case of too much money chasing too few goods. But what is too much money and why are there too few goods? In reality, under capitalism, the majority of the money we see around us is not created by the state, but by banks in the form of credit. In other words, it's not just the state that is responsible for the money supply, and other factors than the money supply also affect the rate of inflation. In reality, it's the demands of capitalism that create the demands for money, with banks creating credit in demand uh, for loans from businesses and households. Businesses borrowing money, this, this credit, uh, in order to invest and make a profit. So the dynamics of capitalism have this impact on the money supply. On the other side, it's also the dynamics of capitalism, the laws and, lo and, and logic of the profit system that determine the supply of goods. Capitalism doesn't produce goods because of needs, but for profit. And the capitalists, unless they can make a profit, will not invest, no matter how cheap money is in terms of low interest rates. And this was demonstrated in the period after the 2008 crash up until the pandemic. You had super loose monetary policy with interest rates at near zero. And yet investment and growth in the economy remain stagnant in the advanced capitalist countries. And this actually also answers the people on the other side, the neo-Keynesian MMT crowd, the people who preach about modern monetary theory and other reformists who believe that you can manage capitalism and, uh, and control capitalism through the money supply and control it through the state, we should add. We have to point out, instead of trying to manage capitalism through money, we need socialist planning based on common ownership and workers' control. We shouldn't be fetishizing money like the MMT and monetarists. Instead, we are fighting to create the economic conditions in which money will eventually wither away, in which can, we can rationally plan the economy and the productive forces according to needs instead of the market. Now, in this period between 2008 and 2020, the biggest worry the bourgeois had was actually about deflation, not inflation, because of the depressive state of the world economy. Even though billions were being injected into the economy through what was known as quantitative easing, QE. Now, according to the monetarists, inflation should have been rampant, but it wasn't. Why is this? Well, partially, it's because this QE money never really found its way into the real economy, into people's pockets. Instead, it was used to fuel speculative bubbles like property, like shares and stocks, and like cryptocurrencies. And meanwhile, although there was, uh, you had austerity and attacks on the working class that were sucking demand out of the economy, even whilst they were printing billions and pumping this into the economy. But... On the other side, we also had many downward pressures during this period on prices. Importantly, across the globe, you had overproduction, this excess capacity. In other words, far greater supply than demand, which was pushing prices down. For decades, you also had globalization, which provided access to cheaper raw materials and labor which led to the development of huge multinationals, these huge monopolies with efficiencies due to economies of scale. You had new technologies, automation, which allowed a, a cheapening of uh, capital goods. And all of these factors for decades previous to now had helped to keep prices down. But now they're all turning into their opposite and we have an enormous crisis of inflation. And it's really only armed with a Marxist understanding of value and prices that we can make sense of this inflation crisis.
that we can understand the real forces and factors behind inflation today. This also requires us to have a firm grasp of dialectical materialism, the philosophy of Marxism, so that we can avoid the one-sided reductionism, idealism, and mechanical empiricism that haunts the bourgeois economics. The monetarists and Keynesians both only take one side or one aspect of the problem, which is in fact an interconnected problem. For the monetarists, it's the focus on the money supply and monetary policy to solve these problems. For the Keynesians, the problem is always one of too much or too little demand, and they think they can manage the demand through taxes and government spending. Both make correct criticisms of one another, but neither finds the blame where it really lies. The real culprit is capitalism. Instead, what we see is that all of these wings of bourgeois economics, the ruling class and its representatives, they all are today resurrecting an age-old argument. They are blaming workers for inflation, saying that it's workers' wages that provoke a, uh, what they call a wage price spiral. And this is really used as, an, as a convenient excuse to justify austerity and attacks on wages and to drive up the capitalist profits. Now, this claim is clearly untrue. In fact, we see that it's wages that are lagging behind inflation. But Marx also answered this argument theoretically a long time ago. In his pamphlet, Value, Price and Profit, which was a response to a certain man called Citizen Weston. Now, in this pamphlet, Marx explains that all value ultimately is produced by the working class. And this value in the form of a wealth of commodities is then distributed either to the working class in the form of wages or the capitalist class in the form of profits. Now, prices, as we've already explained, are the monetary expression of commodities values. And wages are the price of the commodity that the working class sells, its labor power, its capacity to work. And this commodity, it has, its value is determined the same as any other commodity by the socially necessary labor time required to produce and reproduce the working class. So imagine then that the economy can be represented as a big pie, a pie that is produced by the working class, but is then divided between the workers and the capitalists as wages and profits. Now you can measure the size of this pie however you like. In Britain, we're talking about going back to imperial measurements of pounds and ounces and inches. Otherwise, you can have the metric system with kilograms and uh, centimeters or meters. But it doesn't really matter what you use. The size of the pie is the same. And it's the same with inflation, which changes the names of uh, things, but not the reality. Inflation doesn't make society wealthier in terms of the actual amount of commodities being produced. The overall size of the pie remains the same, but now it has a different name. It is the, the, the size of the pie is represented by higher prices. Inflation can redistribute the wealth between debtors and creditors, and it will redistribute incomes from workers to capitalists. Because if prices go up across the board, except for the price of labor power in the form of wages, then the capitalists are gaining as the sellers of commodities without losing as the buyers of the labor power commodity. Their profits will therefore increase because the capitalist profits are the unpaid labor of the working class. If the workers are getting less because wages are lagging behind prices, then the capitalists will get more. The pie gets redivided to the benefit of the capitalists and their profits, as is the case now. What we have is not a wage price spiral, but a profit price spiral. In this respect, Marx says it's not workers who are to blame for inflation by asking for higher wages. Rather, every real and generalized increase in wages can only come about by taking away a slice of the profits that used to go to the capitalists. And that is why the bourgeoisie viciously resist when workers, like Oliver Twist in Dickens's novel, dare to ask for more. We see on the other side that the big monopoly capitalists are gaining from rising prices and are making super profits. And that's the point. If prices are rising faster than wages, then the slice going to the capitalist profits is increasing.
we say that the trade unions shouldn't simply be fighting for a few extra crumbs of the pie. We should be demanding the whole bakery. We need a sliding scale of wages with pay linked to prices. We need nationalization of the big monopolies under a socialist plan of production. We shouldn't just be taxing the rich, we should be expropriating the billionaires and their profits. So workers are not to blame for inflation, but what is? The current inflation crisis really reflects a perfect storm for capitalism. Firstly, there is what Marx referred to as fictitious capital. This is capital or, or money rather that circulates as capital within the economy, but without any value equivalent circulating in the form of commodities. This includes things like national debts, government bonds, stocks and shares, but also unproductive state spending, Keynesian policies of digging holes in the ground, and also things like spending money on arms, military spending by governments. And now the state intervention seen during the pandemic in this respect really helped to blow a gust of fictitious capital into the world economy, which has fanned the flames of inflation. You had around 17 trillion in government spending and a further 10 trillion of central bank money newly printed. Now, as lockdowns ended, all of this money in the form of pent up demand has been released into the economy, but it's crashed up against pandemic related restrictions to supplies. And this means that you now have a reduced amount of value in the form of commodities circulating in the economy, but represented by an increased amount of money. This leads to the generalized increase in prices that is inflation. This really shows the limits of Keynesianism and all attempts to manage capitalism. The bourgeois has tried to prevent a collapse of their system, but only by paving the way for a bigger crisis, by exacerbating all the contradictions. The result is soaring prices, mountains of debt, and even greater volatility and instability in the world economy preparing the conditions for a deeper crisis, not only economically, but socially and politically. Alongside fictitious capital, we also have a series of shocks to supplies. You have the pandemic itself, particularly the zero COVID policy in China. You have the war in Ukraine, which has cut off the supply of oil, gas, wheat, and many other key commodities. So you have a limited supply meeting excess demand, leading to a rise of prices. But in a lot of cases, it's not that the values, the socially necessary labor time, that's not going up. It doesn't cost much more for oil and gas companies in the US to produce oil, for example. Instead, they're recording super profits. We see how the anarchy of the market cannot keep up with the volatility, the shocks of supply and, uh, and the swings in demand. Instead of being efficient at allocating resources, we see the capitalists are actually profiting from scarcity and shortages. Super profits should mean new investors entering the market to bring supply up. But these markets are dominated by monopolies and cartels, who instead of investing to bring down costs and prices, are actually profiting from this inflation. And this really shows the limits of private ownership and the profit system and the need for socialist planning. Now, the final factor I want to talk about is where you have a real increase in value in socially necessary labor time. And most notably, this comes in the form of the rise of protectionism. The pandemic and the war have accelerated the retreat of globalization and the unraveling of world trade. It's led to a balkanization of capitalism, as they call it, reducing efficiencies of production and increasing prices. And this again shows how alongside private ownership, the nation state is this enormous barrier to the development of the productive forces. Now, bringing all these things together, the overall result is that the world economy is heading for the nightmare scenario of what the bourgeois calls stagflation. This is a killer combination of rampant inflation alongside slowing or stagnant growth. A new recession is looming, or even a new slump. But the ruling class are stripped of the weapons upon which they would usually rely to fight such a crisis. Keynesian stimulus will only fuel inflation even further. 
But interest rates that the monetarists rely on are a very blunt instrument. All they can do is to try and cool the economy, as they euphemistically put it, by dampening demand. A wing of the bourgeois actively want to provoke a recession in order to try and push unemployment up and wages down, just like what was done by the US Federal Reserve in 1980. But they're walking on a tightrope. Pushing a, for a recession could actually provoke an even deeper crisis, not just economically, but socially and politically. It could push households, businesses, and whole countries into bankruptcy because global debts are at 360% of GDP. So raising interest rates would kill off a lot of uh, countries and companies. Sri Lanka is a taste of what's to come in this respect. And even here in Britain, struggles and strikes are already breaking out over pay. The key point is that whatever path the capitalists and the ruling class go down, the road is to ruin. On the basis of capitalism, all their choices will lead to disaster. Whether it's through austerity or inflation, it will be the working class who is asked to pay the bill. The stage is therefore set for sharp class struggles everywhere. Inflation, as I've described, cannot be boiled down to one single cause or factor. It's a complex phenomenon, a many-headed hydra. But the real beast at root is capitalism. It's the ruling class who have recklessly sprayed money around the world economy to try and put out the fires of crisis. Like an arsonist being invited to put out a blazing inferno. It's the capitalists who've profited from scarcity and who've pushed supply chains and workers to breaking point. And it's their political representatives driven by profit who've gone down the path of economic nationalism and imperialist war. Above all, it's capitalism to blame, this inherently anarchic, crisis-ridden system. Inflation is a symptom of the anarchy and decay of capitalism. To cure us of this plague, we need to rid ourselves of the market and instead place the economy under workers' control. This senile system cannot be patched up. Capitalism is chaos and crisis. It must be overthrown. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I would like to do a little plug. Uh, Adam has written a very good article on the question of money and inflation which you can find in the latest issue of the In Defense of Marxism magazine, which you can buy uh, or subscribe to in uh, about 20 countries, I think, and in a number of different languages. Uh, and you can find links to all of this on marxist.com forward slash magazine dot htm. We uh, will now go to Claudio Pelotti from Italy. The MMT theoreticians and their followers denied the possibility of a serious inflation, but there we are. Storing prices stand as a burning issue before hundreds of millions of people everywhere. And precisely because of its urgent nature, we must dig in this subject without uh, neglecting the theoretical side. Their basic argument traces back to the so-called cartelist theories of money, that is to the end of the 19th century or uh, early 20th. Let's hear from Mitchell Innes, father of the credit theory of money, who says, the monetary unit is merely an arbitrary denomination by which commodities are measured in terms of credit in which serves, therefore, as a more or less accurate measure of the value of all commodities. So money, we are told, is just an, abstra uh, an abstraction, uh, an arbitrary measure, a yardstick. Money is not a commodity, and metals or any other good has nothing to do with money. The point is that this uh, yardstick behaves in a rather strange way. One day it gives, uh, gives one measure, and the following day the result is different and two equal yardsticks will be no longer equal tomorrow, and so on. A meter today is defined in the relation to the speed of light, that is, in relation to an objective physical phenomenon. But uh, uh, the value of this credit or the value of a certain commodity in which terms is measured, according to the MMT? Let's hear Mitchell again. What is a monetary unit? What is a dollar, he asks. We don't know, 
all we know for certain is that the dollar is a measure of the value of all commodities, but not itself a commodity, nor it can be embodied in any commodity. It is intangible, immaterial, and abstract. So clearly we are left here with a tautology or with a vicious circle, if you like. Yes, money is a measure, but it measures a very concrete social relation. Marx give this definition. Money as a measure of value is the phenomenal form that must of necessity be assumed by the measure of value. Sorry, by that measure of value, which is Five immanent minutes. in commodities, that is labor time. And Marx had very clear the difference between metal money, convertible money, paper money, and unconvertible paper money, that is fiat money. He explained as, that as soon as the commodity money is represented by a symbol, it is implicit in the process of a, the process of a divorce between the two and the possibility of the devaluation up to the so-called general discredit of the paper money. But all this can really be understood only on the basis of the theory of value. And it is a rule to which I know no exception. The discussion about the nature of money is always in reality a discussion on the theory of value. And of course, the MM MMT proponents cannot understand what money is insofar as they don't have such a theory. All those who try to stand midway between the two are in reality ecleptics, like many self-styled Marxist economists who in reality are uh, Keynesians who committed some sins of Marxism in their uh, far away youth. An important question arises here and Adam referred to it. After the crisis of uh, 2008, an enormous amount of money was poured in the economy and why we had no inflation then? Marx explained in criticizing uh, Ricardo that prices are not simply a ratio between the whole sum of all commodities on, on the market on one hand, and the sum of all the money in circulation on the other. He was in fact criticizing an embryonic expression of the so-called quantitative, quantitative theory of money. He explained that money circulated only in the quantity actually needed by the exchange, exchanges operated. After 2008, there was wider overcapacity, rising unemployment, massive austerity policies, and all that depressed wage wages and both private and public investment, the social expenditure and so on. That money that was approximately $14 trillion could not really enter in circulation and was stashed by companies and the financial sector and inflated not prices in general, but several big bubbles in the stock exchanges, cryptocurrencies, properties, and so on. By I'm contrast, not... in the last two years, in fact, the Fed, the European Central Bank, and all the other main central banks during the pandemics came close to the image of the so-called helicopter money, giving money everywhere. And that triggered the present inflation. In many sectors, in many sectors there is still overcapacity, but that was offset by the consequences of lockdowns first and war and sanctions thereafter. There are also other factors that I want to mention in the present inflation crisis. Rent is rising everywhere, and I'm not only referring to properties, housing, and so on. Uh, um, rent or raw material, for instance, are clear, clear, clearly rising. Sanctions, protectionism, and so on are not just uh, raising prices. They're, they are also raising extra rents for different sections of the bourgeoisie. And this is an element of today's inflation directly linked to the increasingly parasitical nature of capitalism. My final point, comrades, is that not enough for Marxists to denounce the avis of the system and say that socialism is, in the answer, is the answer. We have been campaigning, widely campaigning in Italy in the last months, raising the demand for a sliding scale of wages, a successful campaign on factory gates in the trade unions. Uh, the sliding scale was an historical conquest of the Italian working class during the 70s that was surrendered by the trade union leaders exactly 30 years ago in one of the most shameful betrayals in the history of the workers' movement in this country. The ruling class is now singing an old tune I remember from the 80s, the wages prices spiral. But while campaigning, we heard ordinary worker, workers answering exactly like Marx answered in wage prices and profit. They said raising our wages will not raise prices, but will reduce your profits. And as Marx said, 
when theory grasps the mind of the masses, it becomes a material force. And this is precisely the epoch when Marxist theory can win the mind of the working class and become again a material force that changes the world. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Claudio. That was an excellent intervention. And now we're going to move, uh, I'm going to bring Josh in from Britain. When bourgeois writers talk about inflation, it's always presented as a technical mathematical question. They say when currencies collapse, it's because states fail and central banks fail to compute the correct quantity of currency required for the economy, or simply that they live beyond their means. But this superficial approach doesn't actually explain anything. And it deliberately disguises the class question at the heart of high inflation. As Adam has already explained, high inflation is not, inflation is not a purely monetary phenomenon and neither is high out of control inflation. It is the monetary expression of the economic and social crisis of capitalism and of the struggle amongst the classes in society. In that sense, it's the expression both of a value relation and of a class relation. A classic example of this is hyperinflation in Germany. Now, inflation had actually started to take off during the First World War, because in order to fund the war, the state accrued enormous debts, expecting to pay them off with the conquest of new colonies and so on. And the German paper, the Vossische Zeitung, would write in August 1921, it must be admitted generally now that the cause of the depreciation of our currency and the purchasing power of the mark was neither the commercial balance during the war nor the estimate of our military situation abroad, but in a fictitious increase of our total income Inasmuch as the country issued milliards in the form of extraordinary levies, war loans, treasury bills, and so on, without withdrawing from circulation corresponding amounts in the shape of taxes, it created new paper income and wealth incessantly, rather while the real national wealth was steadily being diminished by the war. Inflation was the necessary outcome of this contradiction. What we're talking about here is the massive expansion of fictitious capital that Adam explained earlier. The peace terms further reduced Germany's productive capacity at the same time as adding more to her burdens in the form of huge reparation payments, um, the loss of what colony she had and so on. And that was on top of her pre-existing war debts. Now, a state does not have wealth of its own. It must take it from the various classes that exist in society. And the new Weimar Republic wanted to follow a program of extending, trying to extend the working day to enhance production and impose higher taxes, which were already being avoided by the rich and big business. But it came up against the reality of the class struggle and the German revolution. The workers had conquered the eight hour day in the revolution and they continued to defend it powerfully. And as inflation rose, the workers consistently struck and won higher wages to keep up with inflation. Meanwhile, the monopolists re resisted any attempt to raise taxes or to cut subsidies on raw materials and things like food, which kept labor costs down and profits up. When one minister tried to tackle these issues, he was assassinated. One bourgeois newspaper wrote in 1922, the real collapse of our currency began when it became evident that certain industrial circles were more powerful than the government. Obviously, that's always the case under capitalism, but it became evident here. But even if the bosses had allowed these reforms, they would have simply reduced production and created mass unemployment. And the government wanted to avoid that at all costs and for only one reason, that under the conditions of the time, it would have sparked another revolution. This meant the state and the middle classes were caught between these two powerful classes in society, which were then in deadlock. The workers were too strong, but they'd been betrayed by the social democratic leaders who were then in the government. Middle class officials and pensioners were initially the hardest hit by inflation, not the workers, because these middle classes had no power. They had no organization. They eventually sought that organization in fascism. And all the central bank could do was kick the can down the road, just like the European Central Bank today. It lent money to the state in order to cover the huge budget deficits and also to German businesses at low interest rates in order to maintain production. It then had to print money to satisfy the need for cash that all of this unpayable debt produced. 
But inevitably, this way out turned into its opposite, into a cause of further crisis. The French occupation of the Ruhr region became the tipping point beyond which the continuation of this situation was impossible. Not only did Germany lose access to its most important industrial region, it had to continue paying the workers who were resisting the occupation. In reality, there were only ever two ways out under Weimar Germany. Either the workers would overthrow the bourgeois state, repudiate the war reparations, seize the means of production from the monopolies, and produce and distribute wealth in a planned way in accordance with the needs of society, or the workers must be crushed, the eight-hour day must be abolished, and the standard of living of the masses must be reduced to an absolute minimum in order to stabilise capitalist production and the state budget. In short, it became a question of, count of revolution and counter-revolution. The failure of the Communist Party to take power in 1923 effectively decided the question. After this, the state suspended most democratic rights and effectively installed a military dictatorship. Only then did it feel safe to cut off the taps. And this provoked a deep recession and an explosion of unemployment, millions of unemployed workers. It was on this basis that hyperinflation was solved in Germany in the 1920s. And it will be on this basis that the capitalists seek to solve it today. But that will provoke titanic class struggles, which they cannot be sure of winning. In those struggles, we must raise the demand for the sliding scale of wages, as Claudio put forward. But we must also remember that this is a defensive demand. The German workers actually had that for a period. It did not solve the crisis. We must use the demand in a transitional way to pose the question of who controls society. Because it is only through the expropriation of the capitalists that inflation can be abolished on a working class socialist basis. Thank you. Very good intervention so far. And the next one we'll get from uh, the uh, mountain keep of finance capital, uh, which is Berso uh, from the Swiss section. Uh, if we can go to Luis Romero from Venezuela instead. Si hablamos de inflación o en su defecto de hiperinflación. If we talk about inflation or even hyperinflation. Es imposible ignorar la situación del país que por alrededor de una década ha registrado los índices de inflación más altos del planeta. Uh, we can't ignore the country that for the last decade has uh, had the highest uh, inflation rates in the country, in the, in the world. Y bueno, nos referimos a Venezuela, que por ofrecer algún dato, en 2018 entró en hiperinflación con un índice acumulado de 130,000%. And we're talking about Venezuela, which in 2018 went into hyperinflation uh, with an inflation rate of 130,000%. Esto según cifras del Banco Central de Venezuela. That's according to the Central Bank of Venezuela. Monetaristas de todas partes del planeta no han perdido la oportunidad Tomar a Venezuela como un ejemplo del fracaso del socialismo. And uh, monetarists all around the world uh, didn't miss this opportunity uh, to show that Venezuela is a new example of the failures of socialism. Además de exhibir su típico reduccionismo monetario al atribuir a la hiperinflación venezolana el aumento desaforado de la oferta de dinero como única y exclusiva causa. And they also showed their uh, monetarist reductionism uh, when they attributed uh, this hyperinflation uh, to uh, the increase in money supply as the only cause. Por otro lado, personalidades reformistas eh, y economistas neo-keynesianos asumieron la defensa ultranza del gobierno de Maduro. On the other hand, uh, reformists and uh, neo-keynesian economists uh, defended the Maduro government. Tomaron eh, prestadas algunas ideas de la teoría monetaria moderna como la posibilidad de que el Estado emita más dinero. And they borrowed ideas from modern monetary theory, such as uh, the possibility of the uh, state issuing more money. Aumente el gasto público, el déficit público, sin que esto tenga algún impacto relevante en la inflación. And to increase uh, expenditure and public deficit without uh, any meaningful impact uh, to inflation. Pero más allá del reduccionismo miope de los monetaristas y el vergonzoso eh, contorsionismo intelectual de los reformistas. Uh, but uh, in the face of the short-sighted uh, reductionism of the monetarists and the shameful intellectual tricks of the reformists. Solo el marxismo nos permite despejar la niebla. Only Marxism can help clear up this fog. 
Primero, vale la pena proporcionar algunos elementos y datos. First, I'd like to provide some data. A partir de mediados de 2014, cayeron los precios internacionales del petróleo. Uh, in 2014, the international oil prices fell. Lo que hundió los ingresos estatales eh, ante una economía rentista cuyas exportaciones de crudo representan el 96% de sus ingresos totales en divisas. And this uh, reduced uh, massively the uh, uh, income, the, the state incomes, uh, because it's a rentier economy where the export of crude oil represents 96% of uh, the total foreign exchange, exchange earnings. El déficit fiscal llegó a alcanzar un 21% del PIB en 2018. Uh, the fiscal deficit reached 21% of, uh, uh, in, in 2018. A pesar de los ingresos estatales, el gobierno priorizó el pago puntual de la deuda externa por sobre las necesidades de la población. And in spite of this fall in state earnings, uh, the government uh, still prioritized the payment of foreign debt um, uh, over the question of, of the uh, population and the needs of the population. En una clara muestra de su viraje hacia la derecha reciente en los últimos años. And this showed how far to the right they've moved over recent years lo que repercutió en el colapso de las importaciones nacionales en un 80% desde 2013 hasta 2019. This led to the collapse of national imports, uh, 80% collapse between 2013 and 2019. Y este dato que es muy importante, en una recesión profunda que sumó una caída del PIB de un 75% desde 2014 hasta el año anterior, 2021. Uh, and importantly, this led to a profound economic recession, which led to the 75% fall in GDP between 2014 and 2021. So let's not forget this uh, data I just provided. Bueno, Marx, in El Capital, decía que el dinero circulante reviste el movimiento formal de las mercancías. In Capital, uh, Marx explained that the circulation of uh, money Uh, surrounds the formal movement of all, of all um, commodities. In este sentido, los precios que expresan los valores monetarios eh, de las mercancías. And in this sense, prices, which are an expression of the monetary value of uh, commodities. Estarán determinados por la cantidad de productos en proporción a la masa de dinero. Uh, will be determined by the quantity of products uh, in relation to the mass of currency, money. Y también el ritmo de rotación del mismo, lo que llamamos velocidad de circulación. And also determined by the rhythm of the, of the circulation, right? The, the speed of circulation of, uh, of that money and the commodities. Esto lo menciono, pues el gobierno de Venezuela, para cubrir sus cuentas en rojo. And the Venezuelan government mentioned this in order to cover up uh, their deficit accounts. A partir del 2013, emprendió una política monetaria expansiva y responsable. And starting in 2013, they, they started a monetary, uh, uh, expansionary monetary policy that was totally irresponsible. Que aumentó la masa de dinero circulante en un 60,000%. Which increased the uh, mass of money in circulation by 60,000%. O en otras palabras, multiplicó la masa monetaria por 600. Uh, or in other words, it multiplied the uh, money supply by 600. Tomemos en cuenta que este incremento de la masa monetaria no tenía ninguna clase de respaldo en la producción nacional. And let's keep in mind that uh, this increase uh, in the money supply uh, didn't have any type of backing in the uh, national production. Que como dije anteriormente, se hallaba hundida con el en el subsuelo which, as I explained earlier, uh, was uh, uh, extremely low uh, with a steep fall in the GDP. En consecuencia, la combinación entre el acelerado crecimiento de la liquidez monetaria. So uh, the combination of this accelerated increase in uh, liquidity. Con la caída de la producción nacional y de las importaciones. Uh, combined uh, with uh, the fall uh, in national production and uh, the fall in imports. Resultó en una situación donde mucho dinero perseguía pocos productos. Uh, ended up in a situation where a lot of money uh, was uh, trying to purchase very few products. Los cuales absorbieron la mayor cantidad de unidades monetarias. And therefore commodities absorbed this uh, increased money supply. 
Esto se grabó cuando la población se desprendía rápidamente del dinero que obtenía. And this got even worse when the population started to uh, get rid of their money uh, very quickly. En la compra de productos que serían más costosos en cuestión de semanas, días u horas. In order to purchase commodities that would increase in price in the matter of weeks, uh, days, or even hours. Dando de esto la velocidad de circulación y por tanto el alza de precios. And this way they increase this uh, circulation, uh, the velocity, the speed of circulation, which uh, caused a further uh, rise in the prices. Mientras todo esto ocurría, los intelectuales pro gobierno, entre ellos varios economistas neokeynesianos, and in the midst of all of this, the uh, pro government intellectuals, among them a lot of neokeynesian economists, apelaron a la conspiracy para negar cualquier responsabilidad del gobierno en la crisis. Uh, they made up uh, excuses uh, to deny that the, this government in crisis was the government's responsibility. Aunque en torno a la política monetaria expansiva de Maduro, uh, with regards to the uh, ex expansionary monetary policy of Maduro, ciertamente estos intelectuales se basaron en algunos elementos de la teoría monetaria moderna. Uh, some of these people uh, certainly based themselves on um, modern monetary theory. Sin embargo, su afán de defender al gobierno lo fue ir incluso más lejos. Uh, but uh, in order to defend the government even more, uh, that made them go even further in their defense of MMT. Puesto que la versión extendida de la teoría monetaria moderna entre los reformistas del mundo. Uh, the more uh, uh, well-known extended version of MMT among reformists around the world. Asume la emisión de dinero y el aumento del gasto fiscal no tiene por qué incidir eh, decisivamente la inflación claims that uh, the issuing uh, money and uh, rise in, in, in fiscal expenditure doesn't necessarily have to lead to decisive inflation. Siempre y cuando exista capacidad productiva de reserva. If uh, there is a productive capacity in reserve. Este hecho fue pasado por alto por estos distinguidos señores. Uh, and these uh, ladies and gentlemen ignored this fact. Quienes difundieron la, eh, la tesis de que la inflación se debía al posicionamiento de una tasa de cambio paralela. And they spread this thesis that the inflation uh, was due to the positioning of a exchange rate, the parallel exchange rate. Y por encima del tipo de cambio oficial por parte de una superpoderosa página web capaz de desestabilizar la economía de un país. And on top of that, um, uh, that uh, there was a very powerful web page uh, that could destabilize the economy of a whole country. Invirtiendo la relación entre causas y efectos de manera inadecuada. And so they reverted uh, the uh, cause and effects. Vergonzosamente, estas personas jamás consideraron que una tasa de cambio paralela, al igual que todos los mercados negros que proliferaron en aquellos años, these people never considered uh, that a parallel exchange rate, uh, as well as all the uh, black market that was proliferating in those years, tenían como base la escasez crónica de divisas y de bienes de primera necesidad. Were actually the result of uh, a lack of, uh, you know, currency and of uh, important goods. Fuera de toda duda, podemos decir que hasta cierto punto la hiperinflación venezolana de 2017-2021 and so, uh, without any shadow of doubt, uh, we can say that uh, the Venezuelan hyperinflation between 2017 and 2021 es una evidencia práctica del fracaso de cualquier política tendente a las propuestas de la teoría monetaria moderna. Is actually uh, only proof of the failures of, in, in practice, of any uh, policy that follows uh, the proposals of modern monetary theory. Para concluir, quiero decir que es de suma importancia para los revolucionarios del mundo. And I want to finish by saying that it's very important for all revolutionaries around the world. Estudiar las lecciones de la revolución bolivariana. To study the lessons of the Bolivarian revolution. No fue el socialismo lo que fracasó en Venezuela. It wasn't socialism that failed in Venezuela. Porque como tal, este nunca se instauró. Because socialism was never actually established. Lo que fracasó fueron regulaciones superpuestas al capitalismo rentista venezolano. What really failed uh, were regulations that were superimposed to the uh, Venezuelan rentier capitalism. En el marco de la crisis orgánica del orden social burgués global. 
in the context of the organic crisis of the uh, bourgeois global social order. Regulaciones que por su naturaleza no contemplaron eh, la transformación socialista de la sociedad. And in, in their nature, these regulations uh, never had in mind the socialist transformation of society. Pero que también impidieron que el capitalismo funcionara normalmente. Uh, but they also wouldn't allow capitalism to function as it normally would. La ausencia de una dirección revolucionaria. And so the uh, lack of uh, revolutionary leadership. Abrió las puertas a toda la catástrofe que la combativa clase obrera ha venido soportando. Has uh, opened up the doors to the catastrophe that the fighting uh, Venezuelan working class has had to deal with over the past years. Solo la lucha organizada y consciente es el camino a la emancipación de la clase obrera. So only the organized and conscious struggle of the working class uh, can uh, uh, lead to the emancipation of workers. La revolución mundial es una necesidad imperante. And uh, world revolution is an absolute necessity. Gracias, camarada. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. It's refreshing to hear from comrades who got experience of what many of us have not. Obviously, hyperinflation is uh, a memory for most. Uh, it's, it's, it's only a memory of the absolutely oldest in the Europe. A hundred years ago now, pretty much exactly. Uh, and we're now going to uh, proceed to Laurie, who's also from the British section. What an amazing discussion so far. I'm going to talk a bit about the origins of money. Of course, Marx explained years ago that money arises with commodity production and exchange, but not everyone agrees with Marx. Claudio talks about the chartalists. The chartalists actually attacked the idea that money arises from exchange. Instead, they said it's the state that creates money in order to tax its subjects. And if the state creates money, then surely governments can simply bend it to their own will. This is the theoretical basis of Keynesianism and MMT, really. Of course, the level of inflation we're seeing today already exposes the myth that the state is in control of money and money is in control of the economy. But the chartalists and MMTers will tell us they can prove their theory by going back to where it all began, to history. The anthropologist David Graeber wrote a very famous book on this topic. It's called Debt, the First 5,000 Years. In the book, he argues that money is debt, which precedes money as a medium of exchange, was created by the early estates as a tool of oppression to extract tax. Transforming a moral economy, he won't call it communist, into an official economy where debts owed to those in power are enforced through violence. As we know from some of his other books, David Graeber doesn't always care about facts and evidence, but he does literally dig up some evidence for this. He talks about how in Mesopotamia, Far before money was used for markets and commodity trade, accounts of debts owed were used by the temple bureaucracy and then the kings to extract tribute. He gives the example of Sumerian kings offering loans in exchange for loyalty. But below this argument lies an idealist method. In hundreds of pages in his book, the word agriculture appears six times. By comparison, Confucianism appears 31 times. <laughs> Agriculture, surplus, irrigation, they aren't even in the index. Nothing which refers to the greatest development of the productive forces in history, which enabled all of these developments to take place. So Graeber says these debts are an abstraction created by the state, but he never says what it's an abstraction of. Now we can answer the arguments in debt in a very straightforward way. All that these little case studies show is that the origins of any given phenomenon don't necessarily equal the finished product. Something that may be obvious to us because we see things in their development, but to the anarchists and the reformists, maybe not so much. In Bronze Age Mesopotamia, the time that Graeber is writing about, great forces have been unleashed by the Neolithic Revolution, forces neither the villagers nor the temple really understood. They didn't know what to do with their new surplus that they could produce, so they offered it up to the temple. And an objective system of measurement had to be developed to account for all these products. As the temple bureaucrats began to develop into a class in their own right, they also needed to save to the villagers what they expected as tax. So so-called money arrives onto the scene in this specific case as a measure of account, but it's not really the same thing as money. 
Another thing Graeber doesn't explain is that production in Mesopotamia and other early states were still based on the village commune. The vast majority of villages didn't produce or trade in commodities. So no wonder these calculations were reserved for the account books of the state. On the basis of the Iron Age later, agriculture based on private ownership could emerge. The emergence of the slave societies, long distance trade and commerce, and then money fully developed as a mean of, means of exchange throughout society. But this has nothing to do with the state, but with commodity production and exchange. Now, it may seem radical to say that money is simply imaginary, a creation of the state, but it actually leads us into a dead end, where all we can do is simply appeal to the banks and to the state to cancel the debts, print more stimulus money, etc. In other words, the dead end of reformism. Incidentally, when the Keynesians and MMT theorists are arguing for the banks and the state to solve the crisis by creating more money, they never ask who controls the state, who controls the banks. The so-called anarchists throw themselves on the mercy of the capitalist state. Once again, an idealistic approach takes you to idealistic conclusions, the fetishism of the state, power, authority. But we can explain that the monetary system is linked to the real economy under capitalism, the generalized production and exchange of commodities. So we cannot solve the crisis of capitalism by monetary methods, whether it's by investing in Bitcoin, printing more money or restricting the supply, raising or lowering interest rates. The capitalists can't control inflation because they can't control their own system. But on the basis of socialist planning, we would be able to control it. Now, at the dawn of class society, the temple invented writing, mathematics, weights and measures. They did so to plan the economy to raise human civilization out of the marshes of Mesopotamia. Ironically, the same can be done under socialism. And we saw the first steps of this in the USSR. Ted Grant explained, in Russia, the law of value did not operate blindly, but was consciously harnessed. And in a healthy socialist economy, this would only be the start. We would be able to use planning to raise humanity out of the chaos of the capitalist market. And we could see the withering away of commodities and of money altogether. And then there won't be any need for money fetishism or state fetishism or any of that, as it will be very clear who is in control of society. Thanks, comrades. We're now going to make another attempt at the Swiss mountains. <laughs> see if we have more luck this time. Yeah, thanks for the second opportunity, Nicholas. I think comrades all over the world have seen what happens when your bourgeoisie parasitically focuses on finance capital and does not invest in technology. But I would like to raise my five points about the raising interest rates and the economic perspectives. First, the raising interest rates are an implicit admission that Marx was right. The capitalists can only overcome crisis by preparing even more violent ones. Today's inflation is the consequence of the era of cheap money and the anarchic developments of the world market. But now, dialectically, effect, effect becomes cause. The capitalists have to react to inflation by raising interest rates, but in doing so, they are preparing for a deeper crisis. So secondly, with the interest rate hikes, the ruling class has to introduce measures which are very dangerous. They are slowing down growth exactly at the time when they need growth more than ever before. A huge number of companies have been kept artificially alive with cheap money, so cutting down on the cheap money can definitely lead to recession soon. And signs of this are already clearly visible. For example, business activity in the Eurozone has gone into reverse um, last week, recently. The interest rates are also bringing closer the bursting of speculative bubbles. But the biggest threat to world capitalism is probably the historically high level of debt. And even just the fear of interest rate hikes is causing the debt burden to rise further. For example, the yield on Italian government bonds has increased eightfold since August 2021. It is therefore eight times more expensive for the Italian state to go further into debt. At some point, the huge debt problem must be solved, either through direct default or through extreme austerity or through rising inflation that eats up the debt. But any one of, of this would lead to greater instability. And above all, it would massively fuel the class struggle. My th third point is that the ruling class is in a deep impasse. Currently, right now, they have to choose between rising inflation or they have to choose another deep recession. Currently, the capitalists cannot decide between the plague and the cholera. 
and so they could end up with both. I mean, if you if you look at the current interest rate hikes, they just fully express the bourgeois dilemma. On the one hand, the interest rates are still way too low to really curb inflation. And on the other hand, even without interest rate hikes, the economy is heading for recession. So the real prospect is the worst of both sides. We are facing a prolonged period of stagflation or even slumpflation. The capitalists are aware of their dark prospects. Maybe some of you have seen the debate in the US Senate on interest rate hikes. It was very interesting, but the atmosphere was just desperate. At the end, one senator tried to summarize the discussion. And he said, if we had a real solution, we would have done it already. I mean, this deep pessimism reflects the hard fact that the capitalist system, system as a whole is at the dead end. So fourth point, what does this mean for the working class? I mean, there is no solution for the working class within capitalism, as has been said. The workers are paying for the rising inflation right now, and the workers will pay for the coming recession with layoffs, wage cuts, or austerity. So the working class cannot choose between low or high interest rates because it has to pay for the capitalist crisis in both cases. But of course, the reformists have not understood the character of the situation. In Switzerland, like practically the reformists everywhere, the trade union leaders fully defend the policy of cheap money and low interest rates. In the capitalist dilemma, they choose the side of rising inflation. This clearly shows the need for an independent class position, independent of the interests of the bourgeoisie. So my last point would be, what does this all mean for us revolutionaries? I mean, we have, just have to be honest and say our whole life will be marked by brutal instability, revolution and counter-revolution. Of course, there is no final crisis of capitalism, but we have entered a period of extreme intensification and acceleration. Trotsky said in his World Perspectives at the beginning of the 1920s, in periods of capitalist decline, the crises are frequent, deep and long, while the upswings are short and superficial. What we have seen in the last two years, I mean, this is the new rhythm of the cycle of boom and slump. And it is not boom or slump alone that leads to revolution, but the sharp shifts between the one and the other. Again, our whole life and the lives of the working class will be marked by brutal instability, revolution and counter-revolution. From this perspective, we must draw the greatest urgency for our work and we must just dedicate our personal lives to the building of the revolutionary organization. Thank you. Thank you, Dersu. Uh, well, thank you, comrades, for a varied discussion, touching on several different aspects. I'm going to now let Adam uh, sum up the discussion. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and thank you to all the comrades for really excellent contributions in the discussion. And as Nicholas said, there were very varied uh, contributions. Josh giving the historic example of hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany. Comrade Luis giving a very similar example from Venezuela today. And Dersu also outlining the perspectives for inflation and the crisis of capitalism in the period ahead. What's very clear from all these contributions and examples, and as uh, Claudio outlined and emphasized in his contribution, is that the bourgeois and their representatives, they really don't understand what lies behind inflation because they don't understand their own system. In fact, they've become completely used to defending their system and being apologists for it. Similar, all the academics and bourgeois economists in the universities and uh, in scientific journals and so forth, and in institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, and all the central banks across the world, none of them really are interested in trying to actually understand what's going on. They're just trying to prop up this bankrupt, rotten system. For them, everything is just accidental when it comes to inflation or crisis just seems to be one accident after another, the war, the pandemic. But the war and the pandemic before it are not the cause of any of these problems. They've accelerated processes that were already in motion. They've exacerbated contradictions that were already building up, widening inequality and class divide, the rise of protectionism and economic nationalism, 
all the debts, the speculation, and the zombie capitalists, as Dersu talked about, all of these have been exacerbated by the war and the pandemic. But even when the war and the pandemic uh, end, we will not go back to normal. These huge events mark turning points on the development of capitalism. As comrades have highlighted, we're entering a new normal. The war and the pandemic have turned everything into their opposite. All these things that were driving economic growth are now turned into their opposite. Just-in-time production has now led to these fragile supply chains of bottlenecks and disruptions. The casualization of work and the scourge of low wages have led to shortages of labor. And all this cheap money and credit has now turned into a mountain of unaffordable debt. We've got to remember that inflation actually began before the war in Ukraine. All the pressures that we discussed at the beginning, fictitious capital, the supply shocks, and the protectionism, all of these were already present. But now the conflict and the sanctions have poured petrol on this already raging fire. They've made infl uh, inflation more entrenched, more widespread. And we're only at the beginning of the process. Now, in truth, the ruling class had become extremely arrogant and hubristic about the question of inflation. They thought, even until recently, that, in, that inflation was only transitory. But now it's out of control. They're going to have to go to extreme lengths to try and bring it back down. As I said earlier, they might have to go back to the days of the 1980s with big rises in interest rates to try and provoke a recession. But the thing is, 2022 is not 1980. Back then, you had a sharp recession followed by a big upswing. That's not the perspective for today. Back in the 1980s, globalization was just beginning as, the, as, the, as China and then the Soviet Union opened up to capitalism. Today, globalization is in retreat, however. Also, all of the advanced capitalist countries went into the 1980s with historically low debts. Now that historic highs, particularly in countries like Italy, as we discussed in World Perspectives, and the market today is all the more volatile because of all the money they've pumped in and all the speculative bubbles that now exist. Above all, the world market is far more integrated than it was even in the 80s. They used to say that if America sneezed, then the rest of the world would catch a cold. Well, now the rest of the world will catch something far more deadly and contagious if America sneezes. And it's not just America, but the Chinese economy and Europe, all the other big world economy, all the other big world economic powers are now also in crisis. So the crisis will be far more international and the backlash will be far more international as we are seeing in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. And that's why we're having discussions on things like the question of money, inflation and Marxist economics. As Luis pointed out, the, these differences on how we understand these questions of money and inflation have very real political consequences. We need to understand the world in order to change it and to understand that there is no way out within the confines of capitalism for humanity. As comrades have pointed out, we're like doctors trying to not just tackle the symptoms, but the real disease. And even if we accepted what the monetarist said, that inflation is a monetary phenomena, well, that would mean if we want to get rid of inflation and, and the scourge of rising prices once and for all, we need to get rid of money. But as Laurie explained in his contribution, money arises out of specific historical conditions. There's a material reason that we see money in early society up until now. Therefore, in contrast to the, uh, the anarchists and the reformists, we understand that money can't simply be abolished. Money represents value, and value is a relationship arising out of commodity production and exchange. So if we want to get rid of money, we need to rid ourselves of commodity production and exchange. And that means returning to a communistic society with communal ownership over the means of production, the tools, the technology, the wealth in society. But this wouldn't be primitive communism like our tribal ancestors had. Communism today would be based on a far higher productive economic and cultural level. It'd be based on a society of superabundance. In this sense, money isn't abolished, but like the state, class society, 
and even so-called human nature, all of this will wither away. There'll be a transitional period from socialism to communism, the highest level of uh, communism beginning with the working class seizing the main levers of the economy and of production, putting them under a democratic plan. And more and more, the, the economy would be brought under communal ownership and workers' control. And the more this process continues, the more commodity production and exchange withers away, the more the market is gotten rid of, and the less need there is for money. Products of labor, now communally and socially owned, cease to be commodities. And as commodity production exchange withers away, so the need for money withers away also. Instead of having money representing value in the form of socially necessary labor time, you would have mere tokens entitling people to a, a share of the common pot. And eventually, as all scarcity was eliminated, even these, the need for these tokens would disappear. As people become accustomed to a world of plenty, We'd be free to take at will, safe in the knowledge that scarcity was a, a thing of the past. And we would live according to Marx's maxim, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. I think, therefore, we can leave the final word to Leon Trotsky, the great Russian revolutionary, who says in his masterpiece, The Revolution Betrayed, money cannot be arbitrarily abolished. It must exhaust its historic mission, evaporate and fall away. The death blow to money fetishism will be struck only upon that stage when the steady growth of social wealth has made us bipeds forget our miserly attitude towards every excess minute of labor and forget our humiliating fear about the size of our ration. Having lost its ability to bring happiness or trample men in the dust, money will turn into mere bookkeeping receipts for the convenience of statisticians and for planning purposes. In the still more distant future, probably these receipts will not be needed, but we can leave this question entirely to posterity who will be more intelligent than we are. Comrades, this is the future that we're fighting for, a future without the scourge of inflation and without the money that, that really lies behind this disease. And fundamentally, without the market system, without capitalism, that is the real root of our problems. This is the future that we're fighting for, but it requires a revolution. And that is what we're organizing to bring about. So if you haven't already, join the International Marxist Tendency, join the IMT, and help us fight for revolution in our lifetime.